Help the Geysers by John Tantalan. Help the Geysers! Help the Geysers! They cried out. The two children wheeled the barrow along Boswell Avenue and gleefully chanted in the chill of the cold October evening. It was Halloween night, 1986. Samhain, or Halloween, as it more commonly known, the highlight of the year to 12-year-old Jake and his sister Karen. Both children had eagerly anticipated for this night to arrive for months. With the blessing of their parents, they both agreed they would venture no further than the boundaries of the Boswell area and promised to be home by nine o'clock. The children wore Halloween costumes comprised of tattered old clothing and hideous masks. Jake had attempted to resemble Frankenstein's monster and Karen a decaying zombie. They had managed to acquire a battered and rusted workman's wheelbarrow somewhere along the route. Propped up in the cart sat a hideous and rugged effigy akin to a November the 5th Guy. Although Guy Fox night a week away, the children continued happy and content wheeling the frightful object along the way. The night of Halloween mischief was now about to begin. The first location for the children that Halloween night was Eagle Lodge. The once grand and ominous Edinburgh estate now served as a care home for the elderly. Eagle Lodge commanded a gothic quality from so many years gone past. Although similar in appearance to a traditional old folks home, its purpose considerably different. The building's residents consisted of 30 ex-prisoners, all aged over 60 years old, the majority of whom had spent long periods incarcerated but now deemed suitable to reside in this minimum security establishment. The two staff members on duty that night consisted of Joan and Sue. They had worked together for the last few years and practically knew the place inside out. Joan, it's a pair of geysers coming up the drive. We got anything for them? Sue inquired. Sue stood peering through the large curved window, eagerly anticipating an arriving taxi cab. Her destination was a Halloween party on bustling Queen Street. Joan opened the sizeable wooden door, a loud and sustained creaking sound emanated. The two children immediately came with a burst of singing. Joan, with a broad smile, gave the two children a round of applause and presented them with a bag of sweets. Be on your way, you two, and be careful going up the drive, she said. She kept a watchful eye on the children as they wheeled their barrow up the long dark drive and into the darkness of Ferry Road. She returned through to the staff office and continued preparations for the shift handover. The night shift, staff arriving at any minute, the current team would depart as soon as they showed face. Sue continued peering through the window and eventually greeted by the lights of a car ascending the driveway. All right, Joan, that's our taxi coming up the drive, Sue called out. It's a bit early, but they'll be in any minute now. Shall we, shall we just head off? She asked. Joan was apprehensive of the prospect of leaving the building unattended. Even if it's only for a short while, she looked to Sue. Give it five minutes, then we'll get away. Give the driver a wave to let him know we've seen him, Joan suggested. Sue waved to the taxi driver through the office blinds and the man acknowledged with a beep of the horn. Although Eagle Lodge served as a minimum security location, it did house a rather infamous character. Malcolm McGinty was convicted of a catalogue of gruesome murders back in the 1960s. Once tried, the thoroughly dangerous man spent extensive years inside a top security prison. With McGinty approaching the end of his prison term, it was decided by the Home Office to allow the now senior man to reside in the relaxed atmosphere of Eagle Lodge. 
Malcolm McGinty's presence had raised no concern since his arrival five years ago. He was in fact a model resident. McGinty lay tucked up in bed along with the 29 other residents, always calm in the confines of Eagle Lodge. Sue, growing anxious as the minutes passed, took it upon herself to fetch her coat and bag from the cloakroom. John, I'm away. The taxi meter's running. If you want to lift him, you better come now, she insisted. Joan acknowledged her anxious colleague with a frustrated shrug. Through the window blinds and in the distance, about halfway along the drive, she observed the silhouette of two approaching figures. It must be Margaret and Gordon arriving for the night shift, she figured. Joan grabbed her coat and bag. She alerted Sue to the sight of the arriving staff. They both departed the building and climbed into the back of the dark black cab. Sue leaned forward to the driver. First stop, Black Hall driver, then I'm going to Queen Street, she announced. The driver did not acknowledge, but slowly started the cab. The vehicle began to descend along the dark and winding driveway, the headlights illuminating passing trees. The taxi passed the two arriving staff members on the drive. Joan and Sue greeted them with an excitable wave. Margaret and Gordon observed the departing passenger's gesture and acknowledged them with a look of sheer terror. She turned to her equally puzzled colleague from the dark confines of the taxi cab. They are probably fizzing we've left without a handover. I've got a party to go to, Mrs. insisted Sue, sporting a grin to equal that of a Cheshire cat. They laughed and joked of the evening ahead, paying no attention of the route the driver commanded. Eventually, the car arrived at Black Hall, and after bidding Sue farewell, Joan exited the taxi. She waved to her friend, her signature blonde hair visible through the back window of the cab, slowly disappearing into the dark of the Halloween night. Joan's house sat located at the far end of Craig Crook Road, a short distance from the location of the taxi's departure. The streets now deserted, no more geysers, merely the distant sound of foxes in the nearby woods of Craig Crook Castle. Pumpkins adorned the gardens and houses off her road. Although Joan had been a resident for a while, despised the final route to her home. She traversed the shaded entrance to the path and towards the dark alleyway. Joan held her bag close as she began to ascend the shadowy route. Trees creaked in the light wind of the night. A light wind cascaded through the woods, a scenario made for an eerie setting for sure. Suddenly, Joan paused. She spotted movement in the dark solitude of the lane. Somebody stood at the end of the alleyway, directly in front of her house. It was a dead end up to her front door. Nobody had any business being there, she panicked. Slowly and hesitantly, Joan continued along the alley and closer towards the figure. The street lights dim and the path bathed in a glow of deep foreboding amber could visualise little more than the shape of a significant person standing before her, motionless like a statue. What could they want? she asked herself, her heartbeat accelerating. Joan now began to panic. She drew closer to the figure. It remained stationary and fixed in her direction. Eventually, she plucked up the slightest of courage to utter two quiet words. Hello there, she called out. Still, the shape remained motionless. From the darkness, she observed a sound. It was the muffled sound of shuffling and accompanied by movement from the ground. Aided by the sliver of amber from the streetlight above, Joan finally recognised another shape moving towards her on the floor. 
the larger figure still stood without movement. Then, from the dark, the terrified woman stood suddenly relieved as the sight of her neighbour's cocker spaniel, Harry, stood before her and looking up for attention. Good evening, John, said a voice. The ominous shape was her neighbour, Michael, with his dog. Michael, you scared me half to death, you swine, cried Joan. Michael laughed heartily, the predicament of his now relieved neighbour. I'm sorry, I didn't see you until just now, he said with a smile. Many apologies, my dear. It's Halloween, one good fright's always permitted, he insisted. Michael laughed, and Joan complied with a broad smile. He wished her good night and proceeded down the alleyway with Harry. Joan now felt relaxed as she reached the front door and the safety of her house. She reached into her bag and rummaged for her keys. Eventually, she located them and opened the door. She entered her property, switched the lights on, her daughter absent and yet to return home from work. From the darkness of the corner of the room, she noticed her answering machine flashing. Joan checked the phone and noticed that the number was from work. Immediately, the concerned woman dialed the number and anxiously waited for somebody to answer. Bloody Sue, she muttered to herself. She'd have waited until the shift had arrived, made sure they were in and settled. Eventually, the phone answered. At the other end, Joan was greeted by Margaret with a panic in the tone of her voice. Joan! Gordon, I've been worried sick, said Margaret. Are you all right? She continued with a relieved voice. Joan, confused by the almost tearful sound from her colleague, then replied, Margaret, I'm fine. What's all the panic? She inquired. There was a pause on the other end of the phone, and then Margaret continued. Gordon, he's found a man in the cloakroom wearing an ID badge for a taxi firm. The man has had his throat cut, he's lying dead in a pool of blood, she announced in a shaking voice. On top of that, old McGinty, he can't be found anywhere. Police are on their way, she concluded. Joan froze in terror at the terrible revelation. After a pause, Margaret reappeared on the line in tears. Thank God Sue and yourself are okay. We'd be worried sick that something might happen to the two of you, she cried. Joan did not answer her colleague, her mind now distracted and fixed on another matter from earlier, Sue's party. The reality hit her like a ton of bricks. The genuine possibility that her helpless friend may be in some form of danger. How could she check if Sue was all right? How could she contact the party? The question going through her mind was sadly and very tragically irrelevant. Sue never made it to the party.